delighted to be here to talk about um, following up on the talks you heard uh, yesterday, um, talking about uh, high harmonic generation, which is the complementary process to the strong field ionization um, talks we heard about. And in particular, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, some new developments. Um, one of them we call the ultraviolet surprise, um, that it turns out that um, just going back in history to almost 30 years ago, my harmonics were first observed using ultraviolet lasers, and it turns out that um, uh, we're now using ultraviolet lasers again, and I'll explain why we're doing that. And then the other topic I'd like to talk about is that we now know how to make bright, certainly polarized uh, high harmonic beams, which we did, did not expect to be able to do, although the theorists had figured this out way back at the beginning of high harmonic generation that you could make um, circularly polarized harmonics from a single atom. Um, and what we then figured out to, how to do is how the phase matching physics work and can you actually make that bright. It turns out it's, it's also very favorable. So just some um, uh, interesting new developments and uh, from the point of view of young people in the field, it's very nice that we still don't know everything. So there's lots more work to do. Uh, I don't do this work alone. Uh, a lot of collaborators from all over the world. Um, some um, are, uh, and I will, uh, I, I'll mention their names as I talk about our joint work. And so, just from a forty thousand foot perspective, um, it, what is surprising to me, I, I started out in plasma physics, making X-rays from laser-produced plasmas, which is essentially trying to make a, an X-ray light bulb. You know, heat, heat a filament, except with the laser you can heat it to the temperature well beyond the temperature of the surface of the sun, and it emits X-rays. But in plasma physics, we have absolutely no control over those X-rays. Um, they're, they're, they're unstable, they emit into 4 pi, um, you can't get a short pulse, um, you know, all of the all of the challenges of trying to control plasmas, and that's why you know from um, as a, a, a sort of a, an older person in the field, I am still amazed at high harmonic generation because the as the, the X-ray fields we produce are better behaved than the laser fields we use to make them, and and that just seems strange. Paul does this because of course he did lots of you know, work at laser plasmas when we couldn't really control that shot with that light. And, and this is why I am still, even though it's, harmonics have been around now since, you know, the late 80s, um, they're still just uh, remarkable because, you know, think about it. So in the visible region of the spectrum, we can make these beautiful, um, uh, you know, combs that span an octave. Well, with high harmonics, we can have a comb that is synchronized to less than a nanosecond, but it now spans 12 octaves in bandwidth. Um, the temporal coherence is, you know, sub at a second. You can't, and I'll explain why you couldn't even see a beam if the X-rays were not synchronized to less than a nanosecond over macroscopic physical dimensions. And to me, that's sort of amazing. Uh, the spatial coherence is perfect. Now we can make linear and circularly polarized um, harmonics, and we've even figured out how to start to measure them. Um, and so, to a, big, a, a great extent, you know, again coming from a plasma physics perspective, we had really no expectation that this would be possible. It just, um, yeah. And and so we have wonderful control over X-ray light using visible light. And sort of following up on what Linda said yesterday, um, she talked about how difficult X-ray optics are. They're expensive. You have to polish that optic to a fraction of the wavelength of the light. And there's no lenses, good lenses. Um, but fortunately, we, uh, through the beauty of quantum mechanics, we can actually, um, instead of using an optic, we can start to, um, it's a different version of quantum optics, but, <laughs> but we can sort of play with the laser beam direction, and I'll tell you how this works, to then separate the harmonics 
um, each harmonic comes out in a different direction. So that's kind of like a quantum grading. Um, because we complete two color fields, and I'll explain how that goes works, we essentially have a quantum wave plate. Um, because we can change the color of the driving laser and then change whether the emission emerges as a single burst or as multiple bursts. We essentially have a quantum pop cell. Um, and because we can also, we haven't done this yet, but the, we, can't, we can play with the quantum phase of the electron by adjusting the, um, the, the, the light, the, the laser field um, that's um, present. In theory, we can also make a quantum lens. And so it's really beautiful that we can sort of control the X-ray light by using the laser light to control the quantum wave function of the electron. And so this, the, the precision of this light source is, is now being, uh, making it possible to, to be used. And in our uh, uh, lab, we really are trying to look at what can we see uh, and learn about new materials and nanoscience. And I'll talk uh, about some of these applications in the next uh, two lectures. So maybe, maybe enough said there <coughs> for now. Um, and, and for the young people in the audience, I just wanted to, you know, to point out that, uh, you know, and again, from a historical perspective, you know, we've had coherent beams in the visible region of the spectrum for over 50, 50 years now, it's about 55 years. And of course, when the laser, when it was first demonstrated, was called, you know, a, 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 a solution looking for a problem, but of course, we now know that you know, the, the laser powers the internet, using medicine, of course, science, of course, but also re ranging surgery, um, optical storage, and such. But in that 55 years, uh, you may not know, but the shortest wavelength laser that's in widespread use is the excimer laser at 193 nanometers. And so when you take that ratio of the first ruby laser that uh, Neyman demonstrated and the excimer laser, that wavelength shift is less than a factor of four. And when you think about most areas of physics, it, you know, if you talk about electronics or Moore's law we were talking about, all of those have changed by like 11 orders of magnitude in terms of our capability. Um, but in terms of lasers in widespread use, that wavelength has changed by less than a factor of four. And what we're excited about is that harmonics has a have a possibility of actually be, being a light source that cannot address every application, but for some applications, they can um, photo emission and imaging and others, that they certainly can be a light source that's accessible and <coughs> widespread use. And as Linda said, they are very complementary to the large scale facilities. If you look at their electrical <coughs> mirrors, and here I just show a picture of the advanced uh, light source, a synchrotron light source, but of course, you know, we can also compare with the beautiful free electron lasers. And then see, you know, so just a, again, a very um, quick comparison. Of course, the facility scale sources can go to much higher photon energies for now. We can, with harmonics, we can go to a, a KEV, but there is no physical limit to it in the physics that we understand. That doesn't mean we will be able to get to hard x-rays, but we don't have to see any physical limit yet. So there's a possibility we can um, get to higher photon energies. The synchrotron uh, sources have nanosecond time resolution, and of course, with the free electron lasers, that went into the femtosecond range. But with the high harmonics, we're already, as you know, um, well below uh, femtosecond. Um, if you think about, uh, you know, one of the big uses of x-rays um, are in microscopes. So the best um, sort of uh, microscope as we might think about it, where you take a material sample and stick it into the microscope and, and take an image of that material. So the best x-ray microscope that anybody can make um, is shown here. It's work done at the advanced light source, and it's a five nan nanometer spatial resolution full field image. And uh, we can get to about 20 nanometer spatial resolution with harmonics, and there's no reason whatsoever that that's not going to go to the same um, physical uh, limit as the synchrotrons. 
course, the, the wonderful thing about the facility scale sources are very high fluxes, so you can do single nanoparticle imaging, for example. Um, they're tunable, but high constant, limited access, which is an issue, for example, um, the National Renewable Energy Lab is just down the road from us in Golden, and when they make a new photovoltaic, you know, they can get synchrotron time every six months, and, and in between, if their sample changes, they don't know if it's x-ray damage or if they just made it wrong. So any kind of iterative design needs frequent access to some characterization tools. And that's where harmonics can really be a solution because you, for, for the applications it can reach, you can have it in your lab and really iterate um, uh, a lot of nanoscale properties. So we have medium flux, but we're, we are what we, what we call hyperspectral. I'll talk about that in my imaging talk. The fact that you've got multiple colors, now we know we can shine those colors on a material and do spectroscopy or imaging all at once, and that gives you very nice chemical contrast um, and tabletop and uh, low cost. So I think um, after yesterday's talk, I, don't, I hardly need to show this. We, we, we know in a strong laser field, and I'm going to undergo uh, thermal ionization, and you get this beautiful uh, sequence of our harmonics given with the plateau and the cutoff, and that maximum cutoff is just given by the ponder mode of or regular energy of the electron in the laser field, and that just scales with the laser intensity and wavelength squared. So if we want to get <coughs> higher, high order harmonics, you will either have to increase the wavelength or increase the intensity. And for quite a while, we thought that only increasing the laser wavelength made sense. But now we understand, actually, increasing the intensity also works, but only in the ultraviolet. OK, so, um, so, uh, so what's shown here are some quantum movies that uh, Carlos Hernandez Garcia made for us, and it just shows the wave function of the electron in a linear and uh, that is ionized, undergoing strong field ionization in a linear or a circular driving laser field. So in the linear, in the case of the linear driving lasers, um, the, uh, as the atom um, undergoes channel ionization, the electron wave packet is driven back, you get these beautiful quantum interferences and it is those quantum interferences that makes it look like you're wriggling that electron at much higher frequencies. And, and that is the quantum origin of these higher harmonics. Um, but we've known for a long time that if you uh, irradiate the atom with a circular depolarized laser, sure enough, it undergoes strong field ionization. But because the laser has circular polarization, the electron never goes back. You don't get any modulations on the wave functions, no recollision, no x-rays. But what has been known for almost as long as the linear polarized case is the fact that if you took two, um, two color lasers, the both circular polariz polarization, and irradiate an atom with <coughs> that field, you get the best of both worlds. Uh, undergo strong field ionization. Did I hit something here? Mm -hmm. Undergo strong field ionization, but can also recollide. And I'll, I'll explain how, how that works. And, and because you're driving with um, circuit polarized field, but you're enabling a recollision, then you you have to get out circuit polarized X-rays. So this is a beautiful single atom strong field quantum physics. It's really really beautiful. Um, and what our group has spent our time doing is the. How do we take that single atom physics and try to make a bright beam that we could use for applications? Um, the emission from <coughs> each atom is a dipole emission. It's a dipole transition from the continuum back to 
to the ground state in most cases. And so that emission, of course, has the normal dipole emission, spatial um, distribution. And if you want a beam, what you have to do is take the emission from many atoms and have them interfere constructively. And so essentially what that means is that if your laser comes and generates a harmonic from one atom, then you have to set things up so that both the driving laser and the generated harmonic both travel at the same speed in the medium. If that happens, then the harmonics generated in different positions in the medium will interfere constructively. You'll get your quadratic increase in signal, and you'll get a beam. <coughs> if you do that with enough atoms. And you might think, well, how hard could that be? But think about it. Um, no matter deflex x-rays. So that's essentially saying they, they're not bent by materials. So essentially that means that the x-rays are always traveling at the speed of light in the material or a refractive index of one. But we know that in any neutral gas, for example, um, visible light will, will, will it speed up or slow down? Anyone has to guess. It's like glass. So light, does it speed up or slow down in glass? So now, exactly. So this would not happen in a neutral gas. Now, does anybody know plasma physics, um, what happens to visible light in a plasma? What happens to the phase velocity of visible light in a plasma? Does it speed up or slow down? Yeah, for the old plasma physicists, we always remember that in a plasma, the product of the phase velocity times the group velocity is c squared. The phase velocity speeds up faster than c, but the group velocity slows down. So there's no violation of anybody. Nobody is upset about that. So essentially, you're trying to do this phase matching in a medium that's sort of schizophrenic because it starts out as a neutral gas. It becomes a plasma. So the laser is always going either too slow or too fast. And so for a long time, back in the early 90s, we didn't even think you could do this under any circumstances. <coughs> but fortunately, as you, uh, you, you know, uh, 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 and this does not change as you get older, nature is all the smar smarter than we are. <laughs> so this is what saves us. And so Carlos made this little um, illustration of how hard it is, because particularly when you're using long driving laser wavelengths and the single atom yield is low, what you're trying to do is uh, use your laser as a quantum conductor that's sort of uh, you know, orchestrating the emission from the same number of atoms as there are people on the planet. And they all have to sing in tune at the same time. And they, they, and the, the, the disparate wavelengths make it surprising it works. Because we, you know, we're driving with maybe type sapphire or some made infrared light, so wavelengths from 800 to 4,000 nanometers. But we're making x-rays with wavelengths of one, between one and 30 nanometers. Um, and if your wavelength is one nanometer or 10 angstroms, you have to synchronize to a fraction of that if you're going to add all these waves in phase. And so you, the fields have to add with sub angstrom spatial resolution and sub attosecond temporal resolution because at a KEV, a single cycle is two and a half attoseconds. And so you have to get the synchronization to less than a, much less than a single cycle or everything interferes destructively. So it's amazing it works. Um, and it only works because nature is willing to do it. I'll, I'll show why. Because we would have no hope of doing this with electronics. There's just nothing anywhere near this precision. So the only way we have it as physicists is to sort of figure out, you know, what's the physics and make the physics work for us. And so, so that's what's illustrated just in this single view graph. So on this light and dark colored lasers, what it shows is the laser field at the entrance and at the exit of a medium. 
and then what's shown in green is the ionization that happens as the laser field increases, so this is the leading edge of the laser pulse, and as, of course, the ionization happens near the peak of the field. Now, some electrons go back, that's why the ionization dips. This is the quantum calculation, and it's lumpy, because some are pulled out never to return, depending on when they emerge, but some go back. So the ionization goes in this a lumpy series of steps. And this sort of it illustrates the problem with phase matching that you know the, the leading edge of the laser is traveling less than C. The trailing edge, when there's a lot of plasma, is uh, the trailing edge of the laser is traveling at a phase velocity greater than the speed of light. But fortunately, there is a cycle where you see the two fields at the beginning and the end of the medium overlap perfectly. And so during that single cycle, as it travels through the medium, any x-rays that are generated in that cycle interfere constructively. So some of the laser can phase match. You know, some of that. Um, <coughs> and it turns out that that width of that phase matching window depends on the color of the driving laser. And it can all be calculated on very, this very simple formula that really is not even time dependent, but you can only use that formula if you only apply it to the part of the laser beam that is traveling at the speed of light in vacuum. Uh, in, yeah. And uh, so during that little window, you, you, the sure, sure enough, you can, the x-rays will naturally, if you set up your geometry right, and the, 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 you can get um, a coherent condition of the x-rays generated in, in this window. I have a quick question. Sure. sure. So does that like make it less susceptible to pulsation because you have this like sweet it, spot, or it does? Fortunately, um, it's. It, it, I mean, it, 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 it's somewhat scheme dependent. But in many cases, it is much less sensitive to things like phase fluctuations and other things sure. than yeah than you okay. than you would not normally think about in a highly nonlinear process like this. Yeah. yeah. And so, if you take that and, and you know plot you know the predictions um, of where sh should you be able to phase match up and up to. Um, what's plot on this little plot is the color of the driving laser wavelength from the ultraviolet through Thai sapphire that many of us use into the beta infrared region of the spectrum. And the solid lines, what they show are the predicted phase matching limits based on a, a, a sort of a more psyche, but not a whole lot more sophisticated um, version um, of, of, of this formula. And then the dots are where we confirmed these um, predictions experimentally. So it looks you know, pretty good, actually. Amazing for a very simple, non analytic non sort of, you know, quantum um, approach. But we've also verified that if you put in a full quantum calculation and do the propagation, you actually also get the same results. We don't do it, but our collaborators in, in South Korea have done that. And so, for example, um, uh, and, oh, and I just wanted to point out, just again back to the phase matching physics, so why does this work? Why, as you go to the mid infrared region, can you get phase matching up to the soft X-ray region of the spectrum? Uh, you know, fundamentally, it's sort of just back to the ponder mode of energy. You know, the oscillation energy is just given by the I lambda squared. Um, if you turn up the wavelength, you need less intensity. What will happen to the ionization in the medium if you have a lower intensity? Does it go up or down? If you hit the atom less strongly, will it ionize more or less? Less. Thank you. <coughs> so if you've got less ionization, you don't have to work as hard to pull that laser to stop that laser going faster than the speed of light. The things will not be. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 
Sure. What's the uh, longest wavelength we are able to that we've tried, uh, the, the longest wavelength we've tried, it, we did this with Andrew's ball two step, and it's a four micron laser, because he had all, all, this, uh, all these other wavelengths we had in our lab, but he has these very high energy, we had spent a long time trying to understand phase matching, he had spent a long time building made infrared lasers for all kinds of science. And so he had this nice four micron laser that we could use um, to validate this, but there's a lot of other people building made infrared lasers now. It would be great to test because we actually, you know, it's very hard to do the calculations, as, as you know better than I do, uh, Tony, that, that, you know, because as you go to longer wavelengths, your light cycle is getting longer, but your x-ray cycle is getting shorter, so even the calculations for a tiny propagation distance are really hard, and this computation is very challenging. So, you know, we are hoping that people will come up with the right theoretical approximations so that there can be some theory predictions, because we'd love to know what is the longest laser wavelength that's worth trying to produce. But you still need to ionize. Criteria for choosing is... Well, it has to ionize. So it has to be able to ionize. It has to be, you know, tunnel ionization. Am I right? Because only with tunnel ionization do you get the perfect synchronization. Because if, if, if those electrons, when they're born, are not perfectly synchronized, you lose the... You will lose the... Um, So already at four microns, um, the, and we were surprised actually that it was that simple because what we thought is with four microns, if you calculate, you know those quantum blobs that we had the movies of, if you calculate the extent to which that wave function spreads, it's already comparable to the spacing between the atoms. At a, we use it, 80 atmospheric gas pressure to compensate for the low single atom yield. We didn't know if there was going to be some scattering from adjacent atoms. Fortunately, the ionization is low, so it probably doesn't encounter an adjacent ion. So that helps. But then as you as, as you have three quantum diffusion, and you're trying to coherently add those waves, and the wavelength is getting shorter, at the same <coughs> point, it would be interesting to ask, so when does that you know, perfect synchronization start to vanish when the scattering from adjacent ions start to give you some um, decoherence. So there's many sources of decoherence, just on all the same physics that we used with shorter wavelength driving lasers, but now with much, um, much um, more spread out um, quantum wave functions and, and shorter wavelengths. At some point, the quantum coherence of those waves may or may not be as perfect as they are now. So, so essentially, just summarizing what our understanding was until about three years ago, um, we had that if you use Thai sapphire, you could make light up to about 150 eV in the extreme ultraviolet region of the spectrum. If you used a 1.3 micron, you could get just about to the carbon edge. If you used a 2 micron laser, you could get to the oxygen edge, and if you used this four micron laser at very high pressure to compensate for the low single atom yield, you could get a, 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 essentially a, a, a white light coherent continuum that sort of goes all the way up to the KV region of the spectrum. Um, we had all of these lasers, but we didn't have that laser, and so collaborating with Andrus Bautuska was very important. And this is Ming Chan Chen, Antonio Pachichev, Marbu, whose thesis, this was their thesis work. And this is the only way to make a coherent x-ray beam on a tabletop. Um, this high, these highest orders that you see here, um, at four micron, each photon is 0.3 of an EV, and if you divide 0.3 into, five, into uh, 1,500, you get 5,000 orders, and, and it's still a perfect uh, beam. Um, as I said, it spans 12 octaves, and um, of course, spans many absorption edges, but the whole physics of the process means that we would not see a beam of 
which we do, we see this very nice beam at one nanometer, and you would not get such a nice beam if 